Python is often thought of as a very intuitive language due to its simplistic syntax. However, there are definitely some gotchas in it that trip up everyone from newcomers to experienced coders alike. And these parts of the language often catch people by surprise because they're not expecting Python to behave in weird ways. In this video, we are gonna be covering what I think are the five biggest gotchas in Python and how we can avoid them. Blocked websites, managing multiple accounts and IP bans can also serve as gotchas when surfing the web. But thankfully, there is a solution. Floppy Data. Floppy Data is a powerful proxy service that makes your online activity secure, accessible, and obstacle free. Proxies allow you to mask your IP from the websites you're visiting, allowing you to protect your identity and access geo restricted content. You can select from millions of IPs from anywhere in the world and even select from specific cities if you want to. If you're in the web scraping business, you also have access to rotating residential and data center proxies, allowing you to perform large scale data collection tasks without worrying about getting knocked out. With 99.99% uptime, 24 seven human support and cost starting as little as 90 cents per gigabyte of traffic, regardless of what you need from a proxy service, Floppy Data has you covered. And if you use code FLYT30 at checkout, you can get 30% off your first month. That's code FLYT30 at checkout for 30% off your first month with Floppy Data. Now you've all got and done that, let's have a look at these Python gotchas and learn how you can avoid them. So the first Python gotcha I'm gonna be talking about is Boolean traps, largely because they just come first alphabetically. There really isn't a better uh, reason for the order than that. But we have this function up here that is blurred out, um, and there's a good reason for that. But if we just focus on lines 18 and 19 for a minute, uh, and this get nvar function here, which is actually what is defined up here. And this function just gets a, uh, an environment variable from the environment, simple as really. And we can see that each invocation has three arguments. So the first one we can reasonably assume is the name of the environment variable, but the other two aren't so clear. So we have true, false, and false, true. And just looking at the code, it's not immediately obvious what this is. Now, if you do have working IntelliSense, this isn't much of a problem because you can just kind of look it up using that. But sometimes this doesn't work. So in uh, third-party libraries, maybe the type annotations aren't set correctly and IntelliSense doesn't really know how to read the function or sometimes it will be imported from somewhere that IntelliSense can't see and you won't be able to have that. So in those instances, it is a bit more of an issue. Or for example, you could be looking at it on GitHub and then it's also like you don't have IntelliSense there, so it's difficult. In this instance, we can probably work out what's going on just by running the script. So we can do pi boolean traps and we see we get none and hello world. If I were to do echo foo and then echo bar, uh, foo is none and we get none here so we can uh, deduce from that that either this is some sort of missing okay argument or this is a required argument this one over here uh, but with bar we have this kind of gobbledygook this looks like base64 encoded data but we're actually getting a string out here so we can presume that this one actually is whether or not the the, the value is base64 encoded, which must mean this one is some sort of missing OK argument. And if we were to unblow the function, we would see that is actually the case. We have missing OK and we have encoded. There is a much easier way to display this within our code, and that is literally just to provide a missing OK here and then uh, encoded here. And now it's a lot more obvious to the reader what's going on. If you wanted to enforce this, you could put an asterisk in the function signature here. And that now means that key is still a positional or keyword argument, but missing okay and encoded must be provided as keyword arguments. And because they don't have defaults, they still must be provided. So if I were to get rid of this missing okay, uh, Pylance would have a go at me saying it expected an argument. So we can put that back. And if we got rid of encoded, um, then it would still complain at us as well, saying we were missing that parameter. The second gotcha is exception variables, specifically um, kind of special rules around how this works, except exception as E or EXC or however you do it. So we can have this try uh, X equals one divided by zero. This will always throw a zero division error. So we get the error handling. If we were to print our EXE object within this block, it would work just fine. However, if we were to print it outside of it, and I'm going to use some f-string formatting just to show it off properly, you can see that PyLance has actually already picked it up. But if we were to run this now, 
we get name exe is not defined because exe does not exist outside of this block. And this is actually um, a bit of a gotcha because this is the exception more than the rule. Say for example, if I commented this out, we did with open a boolean traps uh, as f and actually if I do dot pi and then just pass that and then print f dot closed equals that we print it just fine it comes out f closed equals true even though it's not inside this block anymore the variable f persists into the upper level whereas with exceptions it doesn't so that is something to watch out for the third gotcha is actually something I've already made a full video about before. So if you want to know more information, you can go look at that after this one, but it is mutable defaults. And this is probably the weirdest thing in Python because it errors in a really weird way. And actually it doesn't error at all, it errors completely silently. So say we had this add fruit function and it takes a fruit and it takes a basket, which is a list of string and it has this default value of an empty list. And then we return the list back out. We then append our fruit to the basket and then we just return the basket. If you were to print add fruit apple, add fruit banana and then add fruit cherry, you would reasonably expect that it would come back with a one element list with apple in it, a one element list with banana and a one element list with cherry. However, what actually happens is you get a one element list of apple and then a list with two elements and then a list with all three elements. And this appears contrary to the fact that, you know, we're not providing a basket any time and the default is an empty list, right? Well, yes, it is. However, this odd behavior is due to how Python actually instantiates this variable. So this function is defined on the top level or the global scope. And this basket variable is defined within the function signature, as is this list. So basket gets assigned to an empty list and then when you append the fruit to it, it then updates the basket. But because you're just modifying the object, you're not actually reassigning anything, this gets um, appended or the fruit gets appended to the basket that's defined on the top level. So in a way you can kind of imagine that there's a hidden assignment up here. If I can actually type, oh my God. Um, of basket equals an empty list and then basket just getting passed down here. The way to resolve this is by setting this as an optional uh, argument, uh, setting basket to be none by default and then setting basket to be a uh, basket or an empty list here. Or you can use an if statement if you are so inclined. And now it would behave as you would expect because it's now having to create this list every single time the function is run if it doesn't exist. And this is almost definitely what you were trying to do in the first place. And if you were trying to do the original behavior, there are other clearer ways of doing that. The fourth gotcha I'm talking about today is actually something I talked about in last week's video. So you can have a look at that one as well uh, if you wanna hear about this in more detail. Uh, but as a quick run over, you have this double function up here which can uh, raise either a type error or a value error depending on if you pass the wrong type or if the X value that you provide is less than zero. And we have this main function down here, which then runs this function and it returns an exit code at the end. So a zero means that everything ran fine. A one means there was an error. If we were to change this to say double two and then run uh, the script, uh, we print the success as we expect and we get our exit code zero, which we also expect. If we change this to be a double of hello, then the error is handled. We get this type error and we get uh, the error that it should be, but we see that the program still exited with code zero, even though here we return one. And that's because when we try to run this function, the function fails with a type error, we catch that, we run this error handling, and then we return one. However, the finally block is very strong and it sees, oh, we're trying to return, but there's still more I need to do. And then it comes into this block and then we see this return zero. And this return is actually the one that's executed. So the function just returns outright and it never goes back into this block at all, meaning one is never returned. What's even more undesirable about this pattern is that if you were to pass a negative number here, we would run into this value error here, but because we don't handle it anywhere, 
it gets completely swallowed. And we end up with program exited with code zero. We don't see the success, so we could probably tell that something is wrong, but we're not sure why, because we have completely obliterated the error. We're not raising it, we're not showing it. The program has just continued, and now it's weirdly buggy in a way that could easily be missed. The solution here is to just listen to your linters. So uh, PyLance does this by default. If you're running rough, you can do, uh, or you can select sim 107 and that will pick this error up. Um, I don't have that installed in here and I don't have a virtual environment, so I can't show you, but it would pick this up if you had uh, the sim 107 rule selected. If you're running Python 3.14 or greater, it will actually throw a syntax warning without you having to use a linter at all. And the final gotcha I'm going to show you today is just to make sure to be careful around how you use brackets in Python, or more specifically, when you don't use brackets in Python. Um, I'm sure most of you will know that brackets are optional in most cases. A lot of languages like JavaScript or C or something actually require uh, brackets around if statements, for example, but Python doesn't. This helps in terms of you know, simplicity and readability but can also cause problems, especially when order of operations are concerned. So let's say we have this a equals one plus two times three, and then we print a equals that. And then say we have b one plus two times three, but we've put brackets around this one plus two section. And if we print uh, b like that, they actually, return different results. A returns seven and B returns nine because the order of operations is different. Uh, so multiplications happen before additions. So we do two times three plus one equals seven here. Uh, but we've explicitly stated that we want the addition to happen first here. So we do one plus two, which equals three times three equals nine. So the result of the function is actually different and it hasn't errored because it doesn't know that this is what you wanted instead of this. This can also play havoc when you're using the walrus operator as well. So if I were to comment this out, just to make things a bit clearer, and we have a equals two and b equals four. If we wanted to say c, uh, which is equal to a plus b, so c should be six in this situation, is greater than five, we wanna print c like that. We run this and we get c equals true, which is, not what we would expect and actually would be somewhat undetectable uh, unless you uh, saw it because true if you were to run it like an integer would actually resolve to one so c would then become one uh, in numerical operations and the reason this is happening is because the entire right hand side of the operation is being resolved so a plus b equals six which is greater than five so this bit resolves to true and that is all being applied to C. So this is kind of what's happening in the moment. But what we actually wanted was this. We want C, which is equal to A plus B, and we want to check if, if C here is greater than five. And if it is, then we print C, uh, which in this case is six, as we would expect. So while Python's relaxed attitude towards brackets can end up in more readable code in some situations, it can also end up in more confusing code as well. And you do need to be careful uh, about where you include brackets. And if you're ever not sure, then just include them and something like black, I think, removes them if they're not necessary. So you can just include them in your code and then linters will get rid of them or formatters will get rid of them if you don't need them. Alternatively, I suppose you could just get good. <laughs> And that is the rundown of what I think are the five biggest gotchas in Python. Let me know in the comments below if you've ever been caught out by any of these. It'd be interesting to see. I know I certainly have in the past, especially this last one. This last one has caught me out so many times, it's unreal. If you want to check out a number of ways that Python is actually good, then you can have a look at the Python is Awesome series that I've linked in the cards. And I'll see you in the next one for whatever we do next.